Well, uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, Michael called and he shared his uh, experience there. He understands what it's like to be a snowbird, he says now, and uh, he's looking forward to coming back here. But meantime, he says he's keeping us in his prayers and he treasures your prayers for him. Uh, it's interesting as I, I often talk about uh, sanctification and we don't necessarily use that word, but what sanctification really amounts to is it comes in two forms and we're going to talk about that today. One is a completed sanctification, like our righteousness is completed in Christ. He is everything. And so I think it's very important that we understand we're often accused of worshiping Paul. I have no sense whatsoever of worship of Paul. I'm extremely thankful for the ministry that Christ had committed to his trust. And that was to make known the gospel of the grace of God and to reveal the mystery. But because we spend so much time quoting Paul and reciting uh, the words like right division and the mystery and things like that, people that don't understand these things think that we're putting our faith in Paul. And I trust you all know much better than that. <laughs> And so let's begin with this morning by going to Ephesians chapter 3 and beginning with verse 14. Paul says, for this reason, and what he's really saying there is, on, the, on account of this grace, or on account of the revelation of the mystery, the chapter 3 of Ephesians is probably the most concise and full explanation of how Paul got this message. And so, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. In the King James Version, it says that I bow my knee. From which his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in, the, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Meditate on that verse for a while. That we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Not to him who is now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is in, at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Jennifer drew our attention to that verse about without holiness no one will see the Lord. There is no <coughs> access to God by anything that is mundane or normal. Only those, only those things that are holy have access to God. And I thank God we have that access by grace through faith today through the person of Jesus Christ who is our righteousness, our holiness, our sanctification, Paul calls it, 
And so holiness and sanctification are synonyms. They basically come from the same Greek word and are used according to the translator's choice of what fits best. And uh, again, that's why there's a lot of discussion about which translation is best because uh, different translators chose different words and that type of thing. But I'm convinced that no matter how man translates the original scriptures, which we have no evidence of today, there's only copies of copies of the original scriptures. So no matter how man translates that, it is God that illumines our eyes or our hearts to the truth of what's being said. And so last week we talked about holiness is of God. <coughs> this week we're going to talk about our relationship in all of that. How can sinful human beings have any faith or concept that they can enter into God's presence. I don't know about you, but I know in my existence I am sinful. Not in my existence, I'm sorry. In my experience, I am sinful. That which is apart from faith is sin. And it has been my experience, the more I grow in grace, the more I see how sinful I am. But the wonderful thing about that is I don't have to beat myself up for being such a, a disgrace because God has cleansed me with the blood of his son. God has given me Christ as my righteousness. And that's what we need to focus on. I've shared this in the past, but I believe there are two types of believers today in their sanctification process. There's only one type of believer, and that's the one that's been saved by grace through faith, not of works, alone. Trusting in Christ who died for their sins. If you have believed that, you've been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ. And you are saved, sealed, and secured for all eternity. And it's all been by God's grace. But in my experience, those that are saved, there are sort of two groups of believers. One group is doctrinal, which means they go to the scriptures and they search the scriptures, they search the word of God to see if these things be true. And their faith comes by that. They're in the Bible, they're reading it, they're submitting themselves to the Spirit of God, seeking God's truth. There is another, I believe, group of believers, for whatever reason, that aren't that committed to that type of sanctification. And I call them devotional believers. They have believed that Christ died for their sins, but for whatever reason, they haven't grown in the scriptures the way they we think they should have or something and yet they're very sincere and they're devoted and they profess to love the Lord and they're very much more focused on the experiential side of sanctification rather than the doctrinal side and so uh, their prayer life is often focused on things for them, things to, and not that there's anything wrong with that because we're instructed to in, pray in all things, be anxious for nothing, but in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. But for me, doctrine is the heart of my faith, that I trust what the word says and I walk by faith in that as the Spirit of God leads me. And so God is the power in sanctification. And there, like I mentioned, there's two aspects of that. One is your existence, which is in Christ. Christ is your life. The moment you trusted Christ, you died. And Christ 
became your life before God. And the Bible teaches that. We'll look at that, or we have looked at that. But it is an accomplished fact, and it is entirely the work of God. Every member of the body of Christ has been set apart, and that's what sanctification means. God set you apart for his purpose and his glory. He created you in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he has before ordained that you should walk in them. That's your sanctification. Being created in Christ is your position. And so sainthood, well, let's look at Romans 1, 7. <clears throat> Romans 1, 7, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Now, I thought, remember, many of you should know this by now, but the words to be are in italics. That means they are not in the manuscripts. The translators put them in there because they believe that by adding those words, it will bring better meaning to it. And in reality, I think it brings confusion oftentimes. What it really says is to all in Rome who are loved by God, called saints. That's who all those in Rome who are loved by God, they are called saints. They're both adjectives. There's no verb in that little phrase, called saints. They're both adjectives describing those, as he says here, who are loved by God. And he goes on, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sainthood is not an attainment. It is not earned or merited in any way. It is a position or a blessing from God into which he calls men by grace. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, 2. To the church, and that word is ecclesia, and if you look underneath it, if you have the notes, it means to the outcalled ones of God. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been called by God or called out. And that's what the word church represents. People that are called out, a called out assembly. It is a generic word. And so it needs to be interpreted in light of its context. And so here when Paul says to the church of God in Corinth, he's talking about to the called out ones who are members of the church, the body of Christ. And then he goes on to say, to those sanctified. And that's a perfect passive verb, which means that it is an accomplished fact that continues to remain up to the moment. And so the infant you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were sanctified instantaneously. You were set apart by God at that moment, and you continue to be set apart by God right up till this instant, and you will be that tomorrow and the next day and the next day. You belong to God. And so to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, and here you see it again, and called to be holy. That word holy is the same word that was translated saints up above. And so it could be in Christ Jesus, called holy or called saints. There's no verb there. To the ones having been holyized, that's sort of a coined word, but God has made you holy or set you apart. Those who are called saints. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. It is because of him. Now we're saved by grace through faith and we actively believe the gospel. But it is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. 
That is our righteousness, our holiness, and redemption. In the King James Version, it's righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And so those two words are used interchangeably. But it's important that we understand the difference between these words, too. Righteousness is to be just or justified before God. In other words, God has declared you justified. God has declared you right in his sight. And the righteousness of Christ is the basis for him to do that. Christ is your righteousness. You have none of your own. I don't care if you've been working all your life to be a better person. You haven't improved your righteousness one iota since the instant you trusted Christ. What you have done is grown in your sanctification, maybe, if you've done it God's way. There are a lot of people that are zealous, but not according to knowledge. There are a lot of people doing all kinds of things for Christ. You know, I'm sure I've said this many times, but that little ditty that says this life will soon be passed and only those things done for Christ will last. That's poor theology. It's this life will soon be passed and only those things done by Christ will last. We are not, we are doing good works through our body by the power of the Spirit of God. Any good work that a believer does didn't initiate from themselves. It initiated from the work of the Spirit working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's where it begins. And then he empowers you to do that work. And your only response in this whole process is faith. Now, in your experience, you may sweat, you may toil, you may get frustrated, all of those things. But it's God that's doing the work. And it's Jesus Christ accomplishing it in your life. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's look at uh, Romans 15, 15 and 16. Romans 15, verses 15 and 16. I have written you quite boldly on some points as to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me. Now here's Paul talking about some of his sanctification process. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles with the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God. Now, these things are where right division becomes so important. Today, we don't think of Paul as being a priest to the church, the body of Christ. We don't think of Christ in his priestly, high priestly ministry for Israel even though those things are true. I believe Paul is using his priestly ministry, meaning he is the one that God chose. He was the mediator. There's only one true mediator, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord Jesus Christ chose Paul to sort of be the go-between, or the oikonomos, I think it's called, the one who is the revealer of truth to us. It was given to Paul to make known the gospel of the grace of God. So he was the mediator between Christ and the church, the body of Christ. Now that's not in a spiritual sense. That's in a real historical sense. That Christ chose Paul and trusted him with the gospel to give it to the world. But as he says here, to the Gentiles. So that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Now, I, there might be a verse, and I can't remember it. You can look it up and 
maybe if you think would show me but I think the Lord often tells them in the Old Testament to get prepared for tomorrow to sanctify yourself is there a verse in Paul that says sanctify yourselves whether there is or not the process by which you do it is still important we have no power to set ourselves apart spiritually but we do have the opportunity and the choice to do so experientially and that's what we're going to talk about next but let's look at verse 1 Corinthians 6 11 and that is what some of you were but you were washed now he's talking about all those that have believed the gospel he's talking about the Corinthians but it can be applied to every member of the church the body of Christ every member of the church the body of Christ spiritually has been washed that's an aorist middle tense verb meaning it's a completed action you have been washed or you were washed but ye are sanctified and that one's an aorist passive meaning you didn't sanctify yourself somebody else sanctified you you were justified that's also an aorist passive verb being justified deals with the righteousness that you have before God in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God so all of that's done by the Spirit of God and then 2 Thessalonians 2 13 and 14 but we are always to thank God for you brothers loved by the Lord because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the <coughs> sanctifying work of the Spirit, setting you apart, and through belief in the truth. Believing the gospel, having faith. He called you to this through our gospel. And again, we can have confidence as you grow in your knowledge of the mystery, as you grow in your knowledge of the gospel, the grace of God, we can be confident that he called you to this through, Paul calls it our gospel or his gospel, but that gospel is through the gospel of the grace of God. The Gentiles had no claim on the kingdom gospel whatsoever. And he goes on, you, he called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ we are going to share in his glory remember we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ when we when he comes in his glory we're going to appear with him in glory and so that's our existence positionally God has taken care of all of that and then we come to our experience sanctification experientially our existence in sanctification comes through being baptized into Christ our experience living is Christ living in you and that's the difference one is being in Christ to be saved the other one is Christ in you to live so that any of these things that are manifested in our lives by the Spirit of God that are truly spiritual work that are truly part of our sanctification it is Christ living in us Galatians 2 20 Paul says I have been crucified with Christ in other words he died with Christ and I no longer live well, Paul's writing this letter. What do you mean he's no longer lived? Before God, all that he was in Adam has been done away with. The old man has been crucified with Christ. And then we've been raised up to walk in newness of life. And that is, but Christ lives in me. And that's a present active verb. That Jesus Christ at this very instant 
in the life of every believer is manifesting himself through you. 2 Corinthians 4.10, Paul says, We always carry on our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Christ may be revealed. And that's an aorist passive verb as far as we are concerned. Meaning, we're not revealing Christ. Christ is revealing himself through us. And he goes on to say, in our body. So he's talking about in our actions, in our life, right now, physically. For we who are alive and are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. The more that you grow in grace, the more that you understand the marvelous gospel of the grace of God and the revelation of the mystery, the more that Christ will become everything to you. We don't need to look at how the world's going. We don't even need to really look at how our lives are going. God's taking care of all of that. The Spirit of God's working in you. Now, I can give you examples just like this morning. I spent hours today trying to print up a certificate for Rodney, and he's not here. <laughs> I didn't know that, or I wouldn't have spent those hours doing it. But I know that God doesn't make any mistakes. I know I belong to him. I know he's working in my life. And so even though there's a little bit of frustration and a great doubt in myself, God didn't fail at all. It's just that I was ignorant. I didn't know Rodney wasn't going to, he could have saved me some problems. He said, I'm not going to be there tomorrow. Not that I'm suggesting he should have or anything like that. But I didn't know, and that's what I tell you all the time. When you leave here, you don't know what's going to happen when you go out that door. There might be a guy out there that ain't K-47 and blast us all away. Or we might go through that door and something happens. Who knows? We don't know. So how can we really plan or set goals with any sense of security. The only way to live this life is by faith in God and God alone. Now you can plan, but don't let those plans get you all bent out of shape. A friend of mine keeps saying, "God, man plans and God laughs. And of course the, the scriptures teach that too. A bit. You're going to build barns and make all this mine and everything else. Oh, you fool, your life required of you tonight. So, I've often thought, you know, people probably ask you, if you knew you had uh, one more day to live, what would you do? Well, uh, theology-wise, I'd say, well, I'd spend the whole day trying to tell everybody about Christ. I'd want everybody to know about that. That would be the most important thing in my life. Well, that might be me. Somebody else might say, I'd go to my family and spend time in or I'd go to some friend and try to repair our friendship, or I'd do this, or I'd do that, whatever it might be important to you. Well, I'm growing in the idea that the only thing that matters to me now is faith. Trusting God moment by moment. Lord, I belong to you. You bought me with a price, the blood of your son. I give my life to you. I present my body a living sacrifice and walk by faith. Because God knows how he's going to use it. He's already ordained the works for my life. I don't. I can't believe, uh, you know, if it was up to my flesh, I wouldn't be standing here today. If it was my choice, I'd much rather have a pickup and a little camper on the back and go up in the mountains and just cruise around and take it easy and satisfy the flesh. And the Lord and I have a lot of conversations about that, so don't take, right, you got Rodney's little inquiry, little blip on, uh, there's a, anyway, I get a message from Rodney that several people here are included, and uh, he said, pray for the pastor. He was burdened to pray for the pastor. I covet your prayer, because my flesh doesn't enjoy this. But I know it's the most important thing in my life, is my faith and my walk with God. But my flesh is contrary to that. It's got other things it would like to do. And if you say, oh, not me, then you're deceived. Because all of us have fleshly desires. 
And oh, that's just normal. It sure is. That's the natural man. And the only way you're ever really going to have success and escape it is by trust, faith in God, and then by God giving you the conviction and the faith to trust him. Because I do it a lot. I say, Lord, I don't want to go home and turn the television on. I want to go home and read your word. I go home and turn the television on. <coughs> That's my flesh. I live most of my life in my flesh. I'd like to be holy, you know, some saint. I am a saint. You're Saint Mark, you know that? So am I. It's got nothing to do with attainment. It's got nothing to do with the Catholic Church or anything else. You don't have to perform a miracle. You became a saint the instant God set you apart. You're a holy one of his. That's how marvelous his grace is. We'd be pretty much in trouble, I think, if we walked around calling each other saints. And, oh, you guys are so smug. No, I'm just confident. But uh, brother probably will have to do it till we get to be with the Lord. But we are saints. It's wonderful. So anyway, in any experience, uh, let's go on to uh, Philippians 1, 20 and 21. Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope. That's what the two, that's what eagerly expect means. That's a hope. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted. And that's a future passive. Paul has this confidence that as he continues his ministry, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Is that your prayer? Is that your heart's desire? That, Lord, I don't care whether I live or die, but while I'm here, I pray for me to live is Christ. And pray that for me. Not that I'll be any better than anybody else or anything like that, because it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with my sanctification. That Christ will be open. And we're going to touch another verse here. I guess we'll just go on and we'll get to it. This sanctification experientially is a continual process and is a cooperative work. The first one, spiritual sanctification, is strictly a work of God. But this one is a cooperative work. It is the work of the Spirit of God, and then it's also our cooperation with it by faith. And so Ephesians 3, 7 and 8. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace. That's how Paul got his gospel and became a servant. The life you have right now in this world is a gift of God's grace and he's ordained that life for his glory and his purpose and he has works for you to do and it is the it is the exhortation of scripture that you fulfill what you were created for in Christ and so he says, I, be, uh, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And remember that word unsearchable doesn't talk about the depth of this grace or the magnitude of this grace that is beyond counting or anything like that. The unsearchable riches are the untraceable riches. You can't find what Paul's talking about in the Old Testament. You can't find what Paul's talking about here in the Gospels or the early part of the book of Acts. Paul is declaring something that was <coughs> hidden. 
until Christ revealed it to him and he made it known. And so what was Paul's desire? Philippians 3, 10 and 11. I want to know Christ. Now he's saved, so in that sense he knows Christ. He wants to have this intimate relationship with his Savior. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You can bet that that wasn't Paul's flesh talking. You don't find many people praying for suffering. Instead, we're all praying to get over it. Just the opposite almost. And I'm not suggesting we should pray. I'm a little upset that I said, let him suffer, Lord. There's nothing like that at all. I hope we're more mature than that to think like that. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And then Romans 15, 13, may the God of hope fill you. That's the only way we're going to do this, is if the God of hope does it. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then this Colossians 1.10, I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Colossians 1.10, jumping to verse 11. Well, I've got to read the whole thing. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, I believe that every believer in Jesus Christ has this desire to live a life worthy of their calling, to live a life worthy of the Lord. What I also believe is there is nobody that can do that apart from the power of his spirit. And that's what Paul's going to declare right here. That you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And here's how you do it being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and the result in joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you by setting you apart, by putting his spirit in you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. God has sanctified us. And then 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and 10. Remember Paul had this thorn in his flesh that was given to him to buffet him that he wouldn't get puffed up with all his revelation and everything. But he, being Christ, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, you hear people say, oh, he's a strong Christian. I really think they're giving that person credit for being strong when they say that oh he works hard or oh he does this he does that well our strength is Christ and so we need to understand that when somebody says oh that was a wonderful thing you did if it was a spiritual work you didn't do it Christ did it through you and that's what you need to come to grips with and I don't think that the human flesh our natural man wants to submit to that. The natural man wants a little credit once in a while. But if you have grown in grace, you realize that if there's any good thing in me, it's come from Christ, because in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. And then Paul goes on to say, there, 2 Corinthians 2, 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I can really identify with that last verse. And so, the strength comes from God. And then the second part of that, and the faith of the believer. That's our cooperation in that. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. That's not talking about getting saved. <coughs> If you're saved today, do you have to pray, Christ, will you live in me? He's already doing it. So what's Paul saying here? That word dwell means to set up your home, to be at home in you, that Christ is living freely in your life, that you're not inhibiting it or in any way trying by a lack of faith to allow Christ complete sovereignty in your entire existence and in your experience also. And he does that through faith. Ephesians 1, 18 through 20. This is all about sanctification. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his, incomp his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. That's all about your sanctification. It is a total dependence upon God, and you trust in him to bring it to pass. And then Galatians 2.20, we've read already, I've been crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then Colossians 2.20-23, 20 through 23. Since you've died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teaching. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. No matter how much you fight with yourself, oh, I gotta quit smoking, I gotta quit smoking, you pound your hand and you tear up the cigarettes, or, I gotta quit drinking, or I gotta quit this, I gotta quit that. That's not how you grow spiritually. I don't believe that there's a, I don't, I don't certainly encourage it, I don't think it's a good thing whatsoever, but I don't think God's so overly concerned about whether you're drinking or smoking. God is more concerned about your faith. What do you believe? And if you believe the right things, he doesn't have to be concerned about your behaviors because your behaviors will fall in line with what you believe. And so if you believe you can serve the Lord in your own strength, if you believe that anything that gets accomplished in your life depended upon you, then you're trusting in yourself. And then you have the idea, oh, I really screwed that up. I should have done this. I should have done that. But if you're trusting in God, and if you're walking by faith, when things get screwed up, you know that wasn't God. He doesn't make mistakes. If it was the Spirit of God using you for His purpose and His glory, it went exactly the way that God ordained it. If it's your flesh, then you're going to have doubts and everything else. So I don't try to figure out, well, how do I know if it's a flesh or if it's God? 
I just walk by faith. And sometimes it may be the flesh. I don't care. God's got control of that. Sometimes it might be the spirit. God's got control of that. If he doesn't want me doing this, and I'm walking by faith, I won't do that. Now, I may do some things he doesn't want, but that doesn't mean that God's done. He's not, we're not puppets or robots or anything like that. God is in control, but he has delegated our sanctification experientially as a partner. We have choices in it. And so, as you grow in faith, walk by faith and not by sight. As you grow in grace, that's how you were saved, now live in grace. Rejoice in Christ. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will concerning you in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, you are an amazing God that we know have just a glimpse of all that you are. And so we thank you for the revelation you've given each one of us. We thank you for the revelation of your word. And Lord, we trust in you to teach us from it. Your spirit is living in us. Your spirit teaches us, guides us, and seals us. We just are overwhelmed with your grace. And so, Lord, I pray that it's everybody's intention and heart's desire to serve you in holiness, in sanctification. And we trust in you to bring that to pass. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.